please. Okay, so next, Professor uh, Jaren de Jong will continue talking about uh, aspects related to this panel, which is pain and therapeutical approaches. Obviously, fear is a biological factor, and the organism uses fear to induce um, behavior in the in the person, and there is a cultural fear, and there is an ancestral fear, which is maybe the one that we can modify, we can adapt. So it's a crucial aspect of fear to movement. And Professor Jong from the Maastricht University is going to talk to us about this, and he is going to uh, try to work on this uh, intolerance to movement. After his talk, he needs to catch the plane. So after his talk, we'll open uh, the floor for um, discussion. Did you put on my microphone? Yeah, thank you very much. So good morning, everyone. Before I started and talk about uh, the great ex vivo in vivo treatment and pain-related fear, I just want to thank the organization for this beautiful congress. I think it's really well organized. And I think we have visited a lot of congresses uh, in the world uh, for a lot of years. And I think this is one of the top three uh, congresses I have ever visited. So thank you very much for this. Uh, yeah. So. Now, does this work? My pointer doesn't work? OK, yeah. No, no, it's that, it's that one. Yeah, but it doesn't work. Ah, it doesn't work. No, no. It works now? Ah, oh, beautiful. So yesterday we have learned a lot about pain and in which way the brain activates in it. And I think that uh, it's really important that you have to know that if people experience no pain, it means that the brain, or yesterday we heard it's not the brain, but it's the subject in combination with the brain, uh, we're thinking that you are not in danger. So you only experience pain when you are thinking, well, I'm in a really dangerous situation. And we all know that it's not on, not accepted by itself, it's not necessary to experience pain. Even without nociception, we can experience also pain. So that must be that there are specific uh, cognitive processes who are involved in the way how people experience pain. Um, we have seen that there is a lot of research done, and pain is not explained only by uh, by medical uh, issues, but also there is an, uh, a big influence on uh, psychological and also social factors. So, I have a quick view to this illustration over there, and you see that a lot of factors are influencing the way how people experience the pain, the way how they react on the pain. So it's not only possibly tissue damage that uh, cause pain and that cause disability, but also a lot of other factors who are influencing our pain. And we know from research work that there is one specific factor who plays a very important role in the way people experience the pain and the way they behave uh, to their pain. And that is called pain catastrophizing. And if you have a closer view to catastrophizing and to see what it is actually, you see that it is a maladaptive cognitive and emotional mental set uh, that involves uh, helplessness uh, for, uh, for certain pain stimuli, uh, rumination uh, about some, some pain symptoms, and also uh, magnification of uh, pain-related complaints. And you uh, may... Uh, uh, do, uh, my, my see if pain catastrophizing plays a certain role uh, you may, can use of the, the PCS. Uh, it is developed by uh, 
Sullivan and colleagues. And here are some items of the PCS. But I think you're all familiar with it. Um, what we have seen in research work that catastrophizing has a lot of influences, not only in the way how people behave to a pain, but also in some biomedical variables. Um, have a closer view to this uh, research work of uh, Simonovic and, and colleagues. And actually, what they sh saw was that uh, they did some uh, uh, cortical, uh, they showed two cortical responses in uh, Hildley individuals, and they were giving some pain stimuli. And what you were seeing that is that in, when uh, Hildley persons were given intense pain, so it influenced uh, uh, the top down modulation of pain. Uh, and that was uh, correlated by the way people uh, thought about the pain. So actually, there was a correlation between catastrophizing and the way people experience the pain and how that top-down modulation was regulated. Another example of uh, how uh, catastrophizing can influence the way uh, people experience pain. This is the results of a research work of uh, Edwards and colleagues. And what they uh, find was that uh, there were cognitive and emotional responses during a certain uh, experience of pain, which shape pro inflammatory uh, immune system responses. So there was a strong relationship between catastrophizing and uh, shape pro inflammatory uh, immune system responses. So what you see is that, indeed, it's not only that catastrophizing can have influence on the way you behave, but also on biomedical variables in the way people experience uh, their pain. Other aspects in which uh, catastrophizing is associated with, uh, what we have seen in recent work of Weissman, that has also uh, influenced the, the way uh, people uh, inhibiting uh, control over pain experience. Uh, Quambury and, and colleagues, and Van Damme and colleagues, uh, colleagues of us in Belgium, they have seen that uh, when people attend to catastrophize, they are really struggling to separate of uh, painful stimuli. And also, uh, we have seen that uh, catastrophizing is associated with uh, the dysfunction of the end, uh, endogenous uh, pain uh, opiate system. So, uh, the conclusions we can make about catastrophizing is that indeed it not only uh, influences the way you behave, but also it has influence on. Uh, sorry. But that also influence on uh, biomedical values like uh, the neuroendocrine system, uh, the neuroimmune system, and uh, it's all in a way catastrophizing affects your your pain experience. We know that people would tend to catastrophize. They uh, are really uh, uh, are likely to develop uh, pain-related fear, and they uh, relate the fear in association with the way they experience the pain. So let's have a closer view in the way how fear can develop. And we all know that uh, associative learning has an important role in the way uh, fear develops. Uh, you all know are familiar with uh, the dog of Pavlov. Uh, he learns that, uh, uh, that there is a relationship between uh, when uh, food is coming in, there's also uh, a light going up in the room where the dog is sitting. And he learns the relationship between food and the light. And before the food is coming and he only sees the light, he starts to, to self-itate. Uh, before that, he did it only when he saw the, f the food. But why he learns the relationship between uh, the food and the light, he starts to salvitate. This, the, the, he learns a relationship between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. So how does that work in, 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 in pain, and especially in chronic pain? What you see is that uh, patients learn a certain uh, um, professional knowledge about uh, the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus, whereas the pain stimulus is the unconditioned stimuli, and the a certain movement is the condition stimulant. So the patient learns, for example, if you look to this picture over there, when I'm bending forward and pick up a certain basket, I will feel a shooting pain. And that shooting pain is really in a reaction that there is something really bad going on in my back. So that's the relationship that a, a, a patient learns. And uh, of, of, uh, of course of that, uh, fear is, uh, is developed uh, after a while because by each time he experiences uh, this, with this movement that, that painful stimuli in relation to that there is really something going wrong and it's bad, um, 
he is going to avoid that, uh, that movement. An example, you're all familiar, I think, with tennis. Eh? You have a big tennisser over here in Spain, eh? Rafael Nadal. He plays very good. But I show this picture in a book, and it's, I think it was a nice picture. It says, when, if you make this movement, yeah, uh, you are recurring to, to, to get back pain. But an example of how, in a learning per perspective, uh, fear can develop, um, when, it's, when it's the tennis player experiences uh, at a certain time a shooting pain during his game, he's going to avoid tennis. Why? Because he learns an association between tennis and a shooting pain. And because of this association uh, between tennis and a shooting pain, the thoughts of the tennis player could be that he uh, av avoids that certain re response, in that case, in shooting pain. So that's the conditioned response over, over here. Actually, what he learns is a kind of association between that conditioned stimulus and that unconditioned stimulus. So the conditioned stimulus was uh, the way he played tennis, he made, for example, this movement, and the US had unconditioned stimulus was his pain experience. And what you see is you can view that as a certain memory representation or um, a propositional knowledge uh, about the relation between those two stimuli. And uh, you can see that the, the CS can uh, elicit uh, the, the memories of, uh, of, uh, the, of the pain. For example, uh, I know that during this tennis game, I had a shooting pain in my back. But also, uh, the proportional knowledge can be uh, activated. So in the way you expected that there will be pain, so you can may think that if I will play tennis, then I will experience this pain again. So that's an, an, an example of how pain and, and, and certainly uh, fear can, uh, can develop. Um, also, so in which way um, is it that uh, professional knowledge uh, develops? So what are the pathways to, to, to fear? And first of all, you could do it by direct experience. Uh, we saw that tennis player the, who plays tennis, and at a certain time, uh, she or he experiences a sh shooting pain. So by direct experience, uh, fear can develop. But also, it can develop by observation, to see other people with the same pain complaints, for example, sitting in a wheelchair, and avoid a lot of activities, or uh, by observation, looking at, uh, at the, the television or seeing examples on the internet or something like that. And the third way and way uh, fear can develop is by verbal instruction. Maybe you as therapists say to a patient who experiences a lot of pain, so I think when you experience a lot of pain when you are doing this exercise, maybe you should do it a little bit easier. Or there's the doctor or the specialist who said, well, I'm seeing some rares in your vertebrae. Maybe you should, should do, it, do, it still, do it still going on, not to be so active anymore what you did before. So be careful because otherwise it will hurt you back uh, more and more and more. So it could be by, uh, by direct experience, by observation, and also by verbal instruction and the way uh, fear develops. Um, if you have a closer view to fear and pain, um, what we see is that uh, pain-related fear is uh, especially maintained by avoiding an uh, escape behavior from these bad feelings. And the bad feelings are, for example, that, that shooting pain. And when people are avoiding that kind of activities will give rise to pain, we will see that and have this dysfunctional cognitions in the way they catastrophize about the pain, they are not in the opportunity to correct this dysfunctional cognitions. So if you are thinking that my pain uh, is caused by some damage in my back, for example, and you're avoiding certain activities and certain movements uh, which can cause this, this, this shooting pain, you are not uh, in a position to correct that cognition because you're avoiding it. So still, uh, fear uh, is, uh, is going on. And I think what also is very important that we, um, that we have to be aware of it, that pain is an, a normal factor. 
we all experience pain. And uh, if we should experience an, an, a life without pain, I think it wouldn't be so well uh, at all, because I think you will have so much damage, so much injury at that time. There are people who don't experience any pain uh, because they have some, uh, uh, some kind of damage on the, on the receptors, but so they can uh, experience any danger information about those receptors and they all uh, get a right of it to, to have some a lot of injuries. <laughs> but we have to imagine that pain is really something normal, as like fear it is also and to be in excited and depression, also there are factors are that are really normal in daily life. So pain is nothing, it's not something like, oh, this is something really bad. No, pain is, to have pain, it is normal. And indeed, some pain patients have a lot of pain and extremely pain. But even then, it not, it's not always to say that that pain is really something that is really going wrong in your body at that time. Um, actually, what do? patients fear and uh, overall they are feared for uh, the possible selves for example they feared to experience certain pain uh, to, to, to experience pain they are really fearful of uh, they can fear certain uh, some functional aspects uh, for example being restricted or to becoming in a wheelchair some they can feed uh, feared some healed aspects uh, for example uh, fear of being real and on, on treatment Another way, also fear, is uh, related to uh, social and uh, f family uh, factors, for example, uh, being a burden. So if fear uh, plays a very important role, I think we have to deal with it in our practice uh, work we are doing. Uh, you as physiotherapists, I think you are very often, I think most of the time, you should uh, very often confront with people who have you have a little fear or extremely fear, and you have to deal with it. And there are a lot of ways to, to deal with this, uh, with this fear. So what are the pathways to extinction of fear? Uh, first of all, you could give verbal instruction. Well, I know, I see you are very fearful and uh, you avoid a lot of activities because of your fear. Um, and for some patients, uh, if you give some reassurance, it, it could help. If they're seeing, okay, my fear is, is not in relation to, uh, to what the way I think that could happen in my body, so m it could be enough for some patients. However, another way is that you can give the, 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 the patients the, op the opportunity to observe other patients, how they deal with their pain problems. And sometimes it helps. If I see to our clinic, um, at this time, we are doing an, an, a, new, uh, a new study, and the study is that we are providing our exposure treatment in a group session. And, um, and it means that uh, when you see other people moving, uh, we expect it that uh, you will be able to move by yourself more quickly than if you have done it by your own, on yourself. So when people observe other people, it will give more the intention to, to move also. But at the end, of course, and um, that's what we are thinking, the exposure treatment by, uh, by itself, we think is the most important way to extinction to, uh, to fear. If we have a closer view to extinction of pain-related fear, actually, what is it? What we see is that, indeed, it is a process in which the reduction of conditioned fear responses could be seen as a result of uh, repeated exposure to a certain conditioned stimulus, to a certain movement. And what people are going to experience at that time, they experience that there could be pain, but they learn that pain is not a sign for injury. For example, when you expose a back pain patient to lift up a basket, to bending forward, put up the basket, and he experiences shooting pain, he may experience, after experiencing that pain, that he is not be able to move anymore, to walk like this. Most of, I heard very often from my patients who were telling me, when I lift up the basket, I feel the shooting pain, I'm not be able to st stretch my, my back anymore, so I have to walk like this. And you may uh, expose uh, the, the, the patients to that kind of situation, 
indeed, is it really necessary to walk like this? Or maybe you could even stretch your back again. And if you see what actually exposure uh, is, is, is doing, is it is a kind of uh, form of, uh, of, of learning something new, which makes a change in the, in the relationship between the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus. So, uh, which, uh, with a certain movement or activity, that have been seen no longer as a signal uh, to, uh, to a certain adverse event, and thereby also inhibits uh, the expression of the, the fear response. But you have to be sure that what you are doing is that you are really learning uh, an, a, new, uh, a, new, uh, a, new, a new situation. You are learning an, a kind of exception of the rule. The patient learns, okay, with this movement, with this activity, it is safe for my back, for example. So exposure to the, CI, to the CS eh, without eh, uh, the, the US creates that exception to the rule and competes with uh, the previously learned knowledge. So namely that the US was followed eh, by, the, by the CS. And that's the process how additional learning goes. And what uh, in a particular context, uh, the CS movement and the US pain association does not exist. And that is what you actually what you are doing during your exposure treatment. Uh, if you want to read more and want to know more about exposure treatment, I think this is a very nice book to, uh, to sell. It's not because I'm one of the writers of the book, but I think uh, it's a really good book, and uh, if you want to know more about uh, exposure treatment and want to know more and read ab about more about pain-related fear. Uh, actually, what is uh, the exposure treatment? How does it work? Um, originally, it is based on uh, extinction of uh, the Pavlian uh, condition, but also, it is viewed as a kind of cognitive process. And why is it viewed as a cognitive process? Because during the exposure treatment, we make also use of behavioral tests. And during the test, you are challenging with the catastrophic thoughts of uh, the patients. It is also based on a fear hierarchy and to uh, to, make, um, to create that fear hierarchy, we make use of, of photos. And it's called uh, the FODA. You see there are photos of daily activities. And we ask our patients to have a view on that photo with, with in which that activity is on. And we ask the patient, try to imagine that you have to do this activity right now. So the patient is thinking about that. And we ask you, how threatening is this for you to do this activity? So we, this is not a pain thermometer, but it's a thermometer which tells you how much tension it will give the patient when he does do this activity. And why we are using a thermometer, you look, see it over here, because in our first, in our first patients, and it was about 15 years ago, when they look at that picture, they told us, oh, when I only think about that situation, that I have to do this activity, I'm becoming sweaty. Oh, I'm becoming so very hot. And we were thinking, well, patient's becoming hot, becoming sweaty. So that's the reason why we use a an, an thermometer for make the fear high again. So it is not a pain thermometer. So patients don't have to say how much pain they have, because we know they will have pain. But we want to know how threatening it is for them to do this kind of activities. The second step during our exposure treatment is to give a an, an, an good educational partner. You see an example of an education. And during that education, we make use of the fear of violence model. So we're going to the start of the injury. And we are going to see, OK, in which way experience the, the patient his or her pain. What's, what's he thinking about his pain and about uh, the, the, the time that he uh, now experiences his pain? Um, we are looking after to, uh, to his or her fear, uh, fear of injury, fear of movement, fear of, 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 of experienced pain. 
And what very important is in this model is, and you will see it, we make use of the words of the patient. So, it is an, and the way we do it, it is an, an interactive process. So it is the patient itself who creates this fear avoidance model. It is not me as a therapist standing up front the patient and tells, well, I want to explain in the way which factors may influence your pain experience. No. It is an, in the, is an, is an game of interaction between uh, uh, the, the patient and, and, and me. And after all, it's the, the patient itself who creates this model. And we make also use, uh, we make also use the words of the patient. So actually the words indeed where he is thinking about when he experiences pain. Uh, his fears, the words of his fear are also put in the fear of owners model. And after all, what we are telling the patient, well, what we are seeing is a kind of circle over there. And how could we break this circle? And patient is thinking and says, well, huh, okay, I've done a lot about my pain, but it did not work. So to get out of my pain, that's not a possibility. So what I should I do then? Uh, I see I avoid a lot of activities, so I have to be active more again. Maybe that's the solution. But at that time, you ask the patient, okay, could you tell me what's the reason that you aren't active anymore? And the patient looked to this model and said, indeed, yeah, that's cause of my fear. That's the reason why I avoid a lot of activities. So, if I tell you, so, with your back, for example, you have, you have the possibility to be active again. Should you do that? Ah, no, no, I'm not sure about that. So, actually, we have to deal with your fear. But if you uh, over when you fear, you, uh, there's a reduction of your fear, then maybe you should do more activities. And if you look to this negative consequences, that could be positive in the future. So, um, uh, if you really start with uh, the exposure treatment, uh, I think it's based on a personally tailored uh, functional goals. So, what are the goals of the patients uh, in which they are exposed to? Um, during the exposure treatment, uh, the patients are uh, encouraged to, uh, to engage in the fearful situation. Uh, and if pain has decreased in a certain uh, situation or during a certain movement or during a certain activity, you go on to the next step on the fear hierarchy. And I told you that we also make use of behavioral experiments. And during that behavioral experiments, we are going to, uh, to challenge with uh, the catastrophic thoughts of the patients and um, we try to, 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 uh, to have some disconfirmation about the harm beliefs of the patients and the specific activity at, uh, at that time. Okay, I will give you an example of how <coughs> some uh, exposure treatment works. Is the sound? It's for the Dutch people, yeah.
So that was Annika, and she had for more than 15 years she had back pain, and she didn't do that for more than 15 years. And that was her third session when she was exposed to, to, to this movement. And the, um, the anxiety where you were looking at, it was, it was, it was real. She was really anxious about, uh, about this movement. But sometimes um, our therapists have to be very creative. I will show you the next video. That's a person, his hobby was to, to deal and to, to play and to, to walk with his dogs. He had three dogs. But from some years ago, doing and uh, and work with his dogs he also f felt a shooting pain in his in his back and at that time um, he experienced a lot of pain and he avoiding to walk with his dog actually um, um, he gave his dog to a very good friend of him so he was very sad of that and he hoped that maybe there was an opportunity to in the future to walk again with his dogs now you are going to see an exposure treatment in which the therapist plays the wall of the dog. So sometimes you have to be creative also. So as uh, physiotherapists, you all know what to do, play like the dog, yeah. Okay, if we look, uh, what are the results of our exposure treatment? And we have done a lot of research work on it, and um, we have seen that it has effectiveness in, uh, in low back pain patients. Uh, we have seen that it's effectful for uh, neck pain patients, and also for patients uh, with work-related upper extremity pain. But I want to have a closer view to some other results. Uh, first of all, yesterday, we speak about the contribution of the educational. And we are, were all thinking that, oh, well, uh, to educate the patients is very important. And indeed, it is very important. But our experience is that besides an, uh, an, 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 an good educational part, people also have to experience certain movements and certain activities to really deal with their pain complaints. You look at the results of one of our studies, and um, after a baseline period, uh, and doing the, the B uh, phase, there was the educational part. So it was that fear avoidance model in which we deal with the patient that we saw before. And what you see is, indeed, uh, at the start of the, the treatment, during an, uh, a no treatment phase, it was for 21 days, uh, the, the, uh, the, these patients fill in a diary, and each day they were asked about their fear. And when we're educating the patients, you are seeing that indeed there is an, a significant uh, decrease of, of, of their fears. But if you have a look to the activity level, that educational part did not work. And this is an example of an activity in which the patient at that time really uh, avoiding to do, uh, to do that. So that's the reason he scored on 10, because he was thinking, it's not possible for me to do this activity right now on this day. Because indeed also they filled in in the diary, is it possible for you to do this activity? Actually what you see is, on phase C, when the exposure treatment was starting, you were seeing that the, uh, the patients uh, began to believe that indeed it is possible for me to do this activity. So it was not after the educational part. So what can we conclude of that is that the educational is not powerful enough uh, to change an actual uh, escape and avoidance behavior. And front of you believes it will work. So we are seeing that the way people catastrophize or have pain-related fear, uh, it, it influences that. But your behavior by itself, it is very important that you expose patients also to that kind of movement and that kind of activities. So we may ask ourselves, is education, is that for this kind of patients who are really fearful, is that enough? We think it isn't. It isn't a very important factor because <coughs> the patient 
have to agree with your treatment at that time and must have to know what really is uh, where you are pointing at during the treatment. But education by itself is most of the time not enough. Another example of our effectiveness, yes, in, uh, in, in, um, of, uh, <coughs> of exposure treatment. Uh, we have done it also in patients. Well, now we are almost <coughs> speaking about patients who have <coughs> pain problems and uh, musculoskeletal uh, pain. <coughs> but we have also seen that pain-related fear plays in a very important role. <coughs> Sorry. And, uh, and COPS patients. Um, and we have measured it uh, again with the photo, and we have seen that uh, in our study that there was a strong relationship uh, between uh, the pain-related fear as measured with the photo, and it was a, string, uh, it was a really predictor of, uh, of disability. And at that time, we also started to do our exposure treatments in CRPS patients. And uh, I will... Um, what we see is that not only by the FODA there was uh, a strong relationship between fear and disability, and we also did a pilot study in these patients, and it was COPS patients with pain complaints in the upper extremity. We did uh, an fMRI uh, study, an MRI, and before patients starting with the treatment, we had an, uh, a certain test uh, in the MRI, and during that MRI test, we also give that uh, pain patient certain uh, pain stimuli. And um, I will give you only one result of it, and that was a very important result that we are seeing, uh, that um, what we saw was that uh, during that pain stimulus, there was a higher activation in uh, fear-related areas uh, during that stimulation, during that pain stimulation, and uh, lower activation in pain-related area. So indeed, in this patient, uh, uh, who are very fearful, uh, fear indeed plays a very important role in the way they experience uh, their, their pain. So, um, I have a close view to how uh, exposure treatment works in that kind of patients. And what you see is, um, <coughs> most of the time, uh, patients are really afraid even to touch them because you have to imagine if you do like this, uh, you blow, for example, on the, on the arms or on the feet, it hurts a lot. And most of the time these patients are saying, well, don't touch me, don't touch me because it hurts so much. So they are really fearful of that interoceptive stimuli. They are fearful of their pain stimuli. And actually what you're doing to them, you expose them really to pain. Nothing else what you're doing, you expose them to pain. So the first step you're doing in this patient is to start to touch them. And you may think, well, sometimes you make use of some of manual techniques, but it's not the manual techniques that works, but we make use of the techniques to, to deal with their fear, because actually, uh, at the end, you, wanna, you want, really want, also in this patient, that she's going to stand on her feet, going to walk. And if you look, have a closer view to this patient, she had a treatment for, uh, for three months, and after that three months, she jumped down. So that was the result. And it wasn't patient, she was, she was wheelchair bounded. And um, yeah, they told her, the whole of your life you have to sit in your wheelchair. And she was lucky that she visited our department, and at that time that we dealt with, with our CPS treatment. And to exposure, you see what the result is. If she wasn't be able to do this exposure treatment, she still was sitting in a wheelchair. Yeah. And we have seen that indeed also in this patient, fear plays a very important role. So, having a quick view to the results of exposure eh, and CRPS. Um, this is of the first results. We have done a lot of single case studies, and it's published in 2005. And actually, indeed, what you see is that uh, during the exposure treatment, after about uh, f the, the fifth or the sixth week of the exposure treatment, you see that there is an, uh, a certain way in which uh, fear, that is the, the FOM, and the PI is the pain intensity, uh, um, um, decreased. And the way that pain intensity uh, decreased is, of course, an unbelievable factor because Normally, you are dealing with the way they move and the way hey, they be, uh, be active. And indeed, we see also, only to concentrate and to expose people to, to, to pain, 
and it gives, in, in the beginning, it gives much more pain. Even we have some patients who are begging you, please, to stop because it hurts so much that you have to be uh, strong to, to go on and to go on to expose it to that, to that stimuli. And after a while, we see indeed that the pain intensity also is uh, decreased. And that's <coughs> an amazing, amazing factor. Um, it was not only uh, fear, pain, and activity uh, that was going on better, but also uh, some uh, self-reported symptoms like uh, hyperesthesia, edema, skin color, and symmetry. Also, we saw that after the exposure treatment and after the follow-up, uh, this kind of symptoms were totally gone. So, this is very fresh, and I think <laughs> you are very present with it. So that are the first results of a clinical trial, and it is now submit uh, for, uh, for publication in the, in the Lancet. And uh, actually also in a clinical trial, we have seen a lot of good results. And during the follow-up, you see that there is a significant difference in, uh, in uh, the way people are disabled, and also uh, in, in the way they catastrophize uh, their uh, harmfulness of activities uh, by using the, the FODA, and also in the pain intensity again. So even these patients, after you are you're giving them an exposure treatment that is originally based on cognitive and behavioral aspects, we are seeing that pain intensity is decreased. So you might ask yourself, okay, yeah, how could that happen? What are we going to do in the future? Um, if you look, we are going to do an MRI study. We're just starting with it. And uh, doing that MRI study, we are doing four uh, MRI tests. We do that uh, before the patient starts with the treatment, during the treatment, uh, post-treatment, and also during a follow-up period of, uh, of six months. And actually, the patient is uh, going to get uh, the, also the exposure treatment and is going to fill in a diary. And if normally what we saw in our single case studies, at a certain time, uh, fear is decreasing and also pain is decreasing. And at that time, we are going to decide to do the second MRI test. So if, the, if there is a significant difference seeing in the diary, we are doing again an MRI test. And after the treatment, we do that again, and after the follow-up uh, treatment, again. I think this is the first, it will be the first study uh, who is doing MRI tests, doing uh, the, the whole treatment of, uh, of the patient. I can remember, of, I don't know, I don't read it, that this was done before. <coughs> so we are very pleased to, uh, to deal with this and to, to do this. Um, another uh, possibility to to do the exposure treatment is to make use of the virtual reality. I told you that doing the exposure treatment, patients are learning a kind of exception of the rule. Um, and maybe we've seen that the context is a very important factor in the way exposure treatment generalized <coughs> to daily activities. And well, what we wanted to do to test is to bring the patient in her or his virtual reality world and to expose them in their world to certain movements, to certain exercises. And the expectation is that it would give rise to a better generation to daily life activities. So that's for the future. Okay, some conclusions. First, we have seen that uh, when pain persists and uh, we know that uh, thoughts and beliefs have a very important role in the way people experience uh, the pain. Second, uh, I think it is very important to imagine that pain-related fear is a very normal response uh, to, uh, to treating information that patients experience, but the way they react on the fear, that's not normal. And well, we have seen also that fear can be maintained uh, through conditioning factors uh, like the Pavlian uh, conditioning and at the end we have also seen that uh, the exposure treatment uh, could be a very nice and important treatment to deal with this kinds of fears. <coughs> I'm not doing this work by my own. First of all 
I have to thank my mentor, Johan Vlaaien. I think I and earn a lot of him. And also my colleagues of the department. And after all, I want to thank you to listen to my presentation. Thank you very much. I think it's been very instructive to uh, talk about fear. We've seen how this psychological application can be part of the physiotherapist uh, practice. It can be incorporated. Now we have a round of questions for Professor De Jong. <laughs> sí, sí, ahora. Muchas gracias por la exposición. Eh, yo quería hacerle una el ejemplo que ha, que ha explicado sobre el jugador de tenis. Number one. Oh, yesterday it was number two. Okay, can you hear me now? Hello? Number two. Number two. Number two. Yeah, okay. All right. Sorry. I apologize. So he says that he was, I'm going to ask you about the tennis player, the example about the tennis player when she's shooting and she has a pain. I did a course in Valencia, and in that Congress, the pain matrix and movement matrix were interrelated. Uh, so my question is, if you do any gradual exposure in vivo, wouldn't you perpetuate these uh, brain circuits? Wouldn't you perpetuate pain? Would it be a counter indication, or could you indicate this to patients? What do you think about this? I think that uh, pain isn't a contraindication to, to, do this, uh, <coughs> to do this treatment because we all know that uh, patients are experience pain. Indeed, what we learn the patient and we, what we tell the patient is with your pain, you, you have still you have a, a choice. Uh, for example, um, with your pain, you can sit on the coach and do nothing or with your pain, you can be that tennis player. So <coughs> it is not the pain who decides if there is that she couldn't do that activity anymore. And if there isn't a relationship between pain and a certain injury, where well that could be, you may ask yourself, well, is this injury really a factor that says to me that I have to avoid third and movements? Actually, if you see in our practice, in our clinic, uh, if the patient comes to me and I see uh, the report of our radiologist, of the report of our neurologist, or the report of our orthopedist, and they are writing to me that, okay, there is some injury, so these patients have to be careful and to do some movements, they're always ringing some lamps to me and ask myself, well, is it really true that these patients have to avoid certain movements and certain activities? And what I do that time, I make contact, for example, with the neurologist and ask him, could you explain to me that it is really necessary to avoid certain movements or certain activities? Why? Are you sure that it will give rise to more damage, for example, uh, in his or her back? And sometimes there is a big confrontation uh, to it, but at the end, if indeed the knowledge says to me, well, it is really important and I'm sure about that, you, you, you can do still the same uh, treatment, you can do still uh, doing the exposure treatment, but uh, you make use of not all the activities 
the, the, the patient wants to do. So, if, for example, if uh, if he may still um, lifting up a certain basket, but the baskets may not being um, more heavier than, for example, 10 kilogram, you do that. So you are not exposed to patients to baskets which are weighing, for example, 20 kilograms. But I think you have to be sure that uh, indeed that is in really in a relationship between the kind of injury that is possible there and also that the patient is indeed is not be able to do that activity anymore. So pain is not an, uh, <coughs> um, it's not a factor which we are using in our treatment. We know that pain, patients have pain. Actually, what they learned is that pain is not a signal of something really bad. And what you've seen is indeed uh, also in COPS patients, after a while, pain is increasing. So why, why should we deal with, 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 with the pain? Pain is not a signal that tells me to stop or to be careful or don't do this kind of, uh, of, of, of exposure treatment. Is that an answer to your question? No, no, it's not an answer. I see it you. <laughs> well, yeah. He was saying that the question was uh, about the relationship I was talking about the uh, pain metrics and movement metrics, and whether they are closely interrelated. That was the question, whether through um, is exposure treatment, uh, wouldn't you perpetuate this uh, brain circuit? That was the question. Uh, that's what we are going to test with our new uh, research work, with our new study. That's why we're doing the, the the MRI study to see actually if there is an, indeed there is a strangulation between uh, s certain um, difference uh, between the exposure treatment and uh, the pain matrix. So uh, there is a lot of research works done, but we have never seen doing a certain uh, treatment period if there are really changes in, in our brain and certain for, for the pain matrix. So we expected that it will be, but I'm not, yeah, no, of course not for sure, we have to test that. So. Okay. Yes, hello. When I've seen the example of the uh, patient lifting the crate, the patient with the low back pain, I wonder in which, uh, in when do we uh, uh, decide that we're going to start doing this activity? Bearing in mind especially that the increase in pain through the activity is very strong, maybe the patient will lose the confidence in the treatment and in the therapist. So my question is, what conditions should we bear in mind, should we assess, should we wait to decide when to decide the graded exposure treatment? Um, you always can start with the exposure treatment, but if you are not sure by yourself, and I can imagine that, I think that's the reason you make use of a fear hierarchy. Maybe if you think at that time to lift up a certain basket is too threatening for the patient because she will experience a lot of pain, you could start with an activity that is not so much threatening for her. And that's the reason you make use of that fear hierarchy. So you could start with a treatment or with an exercise, with an activity, and where she really will be successful in. So if she is successful in one exercise, in, in one activity, in one movement, you can make the next step. After all, you only can start with an exposure treatment if the patient is ready to engage in this treatment. If a patient is still searching for a certain pain relief, comes to you, please help me right off my pain, I think that's not the right moment to start. Sí, pero yes, but when do we decide that is the right moment to start? When do we, when do we make that decision? When the, when the patient is ready for it. Yeah. 
If the patient is ready, you can start. Yeah. So I can, and there are no other reasons for it. Yeah. Yes, but I mean specifically about the doing these activities. When do we decide that we can start with these activities themselves? Mm, I, maybe it's, it's it are your fears actually when do we start with this activity? And I say, I, oh, I can't imagine that, but also as therapists, you have to overwin your own fear. Yeah. Because I, I can give no other answer than you have the opportunity to start directly after patients experience the, the pain or do it four months, five months, 10 years, 15 years later, it doesn't matter at which time you are starting. If the patient stands open for this treatment, you may start. So there is not a certain point of, not a certain starting point. The patient has to know indeed and has to, to know and to deal with it that indeed pain uh, related fear plays a very important role in the way I experience my pain. And if she or he or she is, has the willingness to, to deal with this exposure treatment, you may start. I see no other starting point. Okay? Yeah.